Grab your Bible this morning, open it to John chapter 3. We're going to be talking about a very important question this morning in our series, what, why, and how. We've been asking big questions that deal with God and the Bible, and I hope you will text in a question. It's just a great way for us to dialogue and be a part of that. I'm really looking forward to next week, so I hope you'll ask and text in some tough questions. This morning, we're going to ask the question, how do I know if I'm going to heaven? Well, that's a big one, isn't it? How do I know? How, how can I be assured that I will go to heaven when I die here on earth? This is a great question. Now, somebody once said, eternity is in the heart of every man. That's true. In every single one of us, there is this resident or residual idea, concept, that philosophy about eternity. And we don't even have to be taught it. We don't have to be told it. It doesn't have to be something we learn in school. It's just there. And here's what's interesting. If you look at every single culture that has ever lived on the planet, the oldest to now, all of us, every culture has a concept about life after death. All of us. They're all different. They're all varied. They're all, they're all changing. But we all have the concept. Why? Because it's here. It's in our heart. It's in our mind. Can't get away from it. Because we are created in the image of God and because God wants to live with us for eternity. So this morning, we are going to look at the truth that we discover in God's word about eternity, eternal life, heaven, these things, the kingdom of heaven, they're all there. Now, I want to start by defining heaven from a biblical perspective. I just want to do a couple things and show you a couple verses that are in the Bible. These are things that throughout the words of the Bible we see as truths communicated about what heaven is, what it's like, what's going on, things like that. The first is heaven is referred to often as the creation of God that we see from earth. So what we would consider space, right? Everything in space Planets, galaxies, stars, everything out there off of the planet, the Bible calls the heavenlies or the heavens, like in Psalm 33, 6, where it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. Second, heaven is referred to as the dwelling place of God, if someone who is omnipresent can actually dwell somewhere. It's kind of an interesting subject. It's another whole theological rabbit trail that we won't go down today. But often scripture will say things like this in Psalm 33, verse 13. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. It's the dwelling place of God. It's also, Jesus refers to this several times throughout his lifetime and his teachings, that heaven is the place where he came from. In John 6, 38, he said, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. So it's this place where Jesus came from. We also see throughout the New Testament especially, that heaven is the future home for a believer in Jesus Christ. Like in Philippians 3, chapter, 20, or chapter 3, verse 20, that says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter, Peter actually says that heaven is our home, and we are just strangers and aliens here. So look around the room really quick. Look around the room. See a UFO anywhere? I do. I see some aliens in the room. Weird. They're, those aliens are weird looking things, aren't they? I just... Uh. Another thing that is interesting throughout scripture, heaven is referred to in this interesting concept, kind of like a storage unit or a storage place. In Matthew 6, verse 20, when Jesus was talking about how you and I live in the kingdom of God, he said this, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, 
where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Interesting that you and I somehow in our life with Christ, when we, are, when we bless the poor, when we fund the kingdom, when we live for Christ and lead others to Christ, we are sending treasure to heaven in some sort of heavenly bank account that can never be stolen from. I think that sounds really good. Lastly, heaven is open to everyone. This is something we see throughout scripture as well. We see it especially in the words of Jesus. Let me read a couple to you. In John chapter 6, verse 47 to 51, here's something Jesus said about heaven being open to everyone. He said, I'm telling you the most solemn and sober truth now. Whoever, whoever, whoever believes in me has real life, eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna bread in the desert and died, but now here is bread that truly comes down out of heaven. Anyone eating this bread will not die ever. I am the bread, living bread, who came down out of heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live and forever. The bread that I present to the world so that it can eat and live is myself, this flesh and blood self. So Jesus declared that he is the bread of life, that bread, bread is life in cultures where, uh, that are farming based, they, they understand that bread is life, that it, it's this symbolism that bread is life. And here Jesus is saying, I am life. So those are just a couple of things that we recognize in scripture about heaven. Now, along the way this morning, I'm also going to do some myth busters about heaven because all of us have ideas about heaven. Our culture has ideas about heaven. And I'm going to give us some myth busters about heaven. Uh, I'm going to start with a big one um, and just kind of throw it out there just because it's so big and ominous. And I'm going to tell you this, uh, there's nothing in the Bible in fact, what we could declare this morning is all dogs do not go to heaven. Amen. I'm sorry, love my pet, my, my chocolate lab and my miniature schnauzer are near and dear to my heart, the lab more than the schnauzer. Um, and that's uh, not in here. Like I'm hoping, I was hoping I could find something in here that my childhood dog named Meadow that was just awesome would be with me, but it's, I can't find it. It's not here. So I'm sorry. Some of you will probably leave right now, and I'm just sorry about that. Here's another interesting one. The Bible doesn't say all good people go to heaven. In fact, it actually says the opposite, that being good doesn't get you into heaven at all. It also doesn't say being bad gets you out of heaven. Interestingly, Jesus was crucified next to a thief, a breaker of the Ten Commandments. We don't even know him he could be a horrible person for all we know. And Jesus said what? Today, you will be, be with me in paradise because he believed in Jesus Christ. Back to our question. How do I know if I'm going to heaven? This question is about assurance. We want to know. How can I be sure that I'm going? Well, that's where John 3 comes in. There's this moment in Jesus' life in John chapter 3 where he hangs out with a religious teacher of the law named Nicodemus. And in this moment, Jesus shares with us some of the most important things about eternal life, about heaven, and how you and I can be absolutely sure where we're going. And I want us to look at it together. So if you have your Bible, we're heading to John chapter 3. If you're um, looking on your phone, you can... Head there to Bible Gateway or whatever app you use to get to your Bible. John chapter three, I'm gonna start in verse one. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into your mother's womb to be born. And here's what I want to point out really quick about Nicodemus. Here's a guy who is a very influential religious leader, has spent his entire life studying the Old Testament and the Word of God, and he's still got questions. That's good news for us, amen? And we got questions too. We've all got big God questions. And here's a guy who's been religious and studying God his whole life. And he's got questions too. So it's okay to have a question. It's okay to wonder these things. And it's okay to get to the truth from God's word. Verse five, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. I'm going to stop there before we go on to the next very important paragraph. I want to point out two things quickly with us that are from these verses 1 through 15. The first thing that we see is something Jesus shares twice in verse 3 and verse 7. Jesus says, you must be born again. Now, Jesus said, everyone on the planet has to be born of water and of spirit. Born of water is our physical birth. And since all of you are in the room, I'm assuming you've been physically born. But you might have to poke your neighbor just to figure that out. Do that real quick. Just poke your neighbor. Say, yep, okay, you're alive. Great. So you've been physically born. But here's what Jesus says. This is, that's interesting. That's not enough. It's not enough to just be physically born and be on this planet and live here. You must be born again. You must have a spiritual birth. And this is where our spirit connects with God, who is spirit. And we begin a relationship with God, our heavenly father, our creator, our sustainer, the one who loves us more than anyone. This is where we become born again. And it happens in the way that Jesus talks about at the end of the section, verse 15, when he says, everyone who believes may have eternal life. So Jesus says this being born again thing, it happens as you believe in me, as you believe that I'm the bread of life, as you believe that I died and rose again for you. We must enter into this relationship with Jesus Christ by believing. And then John takes over and we have these famous verses, verses 16 through 21, that talk all about how you and I must believe in Jesus Christ. And when we do, it is our assurance that we can know we will be going to heaven. Look at verse 16 with me. And actually, could we read it out loud together? Such a good verse, right? So John 3, 16, let's read it out loud together. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Very good. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. 
Now, this section of verses is so important. It's vital to how you and I can know we are going to heaven. And there's two things here. We can know we're going to heaven when we, number one, believe in Jesus. It's all throughout the whole section. The idea of believing in Jesus. Now, primarily in his death and his resurrection and how it saves our soul, we believe willingly that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. We believe he came back to life three days later to conquer death for us so that we could live in heaven with him forever. Now, the resurrection of Jesus is huge. It's everything because at the resurrection, Jesus conquered death. On the cross, he died for our sin, paid the penalty for our sin, and and the forgiveness for our sin is available. Through the resurrection, he conquered death for us. That's what allows us into eternity, what allows us to heaven, to go to heaven because Jesus can give you and I heaven because it's his. Eternity is his. It's in his control. It's in his power. It's in his wheelhouse. It's because he has it. He owns it. It's his and his alone. And no one else has claim over eternity. This is similar to if I walked up to you and I said, would you like a Snickers? And you'd say, yes, I'd like a Snickers. Wouldn't it be odd if I said, okay, we'll go to the store and get one. You're like, you're assuming I have one and I'm going to give it to you. That's what you were assuming by the question. The same is true for Jesus. When we say, Jesus, will you give me eternal life? He can say yes, because he's got it in his pocket. It's his and he can give it to you. Now, believing also means that we are going to believe everything about Jesus. We're going to believe that he is co-equal with God the Father and God the Spirit. We're going to believe that he left heaven, came to earth, was born of a virgin Mary, and was completely human and completely God at the same time. We're going to believe that he did miracles, that he cast out demons, that he walked on water, that he calmed storms, that he raised the dead, that he opened blind eyes, that he made huge catches of fish. We're going to believe that he left earth and he sits in power alive today at the right hand of God the Father. We believe that he gives us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, that we might honor Jesus with our lives. This is what it means to believe in Jesus. Now, I have to tell you, God is so smart. He is so wise. Because by making, believing in Jesus Christ, the condition for going to heaven he took out all of the, he he uncomplicated all of it. Here's what I love about belief. All we have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. Here's what's awesome about that. The poorest person in the world can believe in Jesus Christ. And the richest person in the world can believe in Jesus Christ. You can have the crappiest day in the world and believe in Jesus Christ knowing your day's okay. And you can have the best day of your life believing in Jesus Christ and you're okay. You don't have to be a part of any institution So like, I got to be a part of this church. No, you're a part of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that it's not about, I have to be a part of a certain church to get in? I mean, what if that church wasn't in your town? You're just out? No, that's not it. It's about believing. And everybody on the planet, no matter where they're at, at what stage of their life at, what social economic status they are, it doesn't matter. Anyone can believe. Amen? That's good news. God did that. Why? Because God is smart and God is wise. The second way that you and I can know that we are saved and we are going to heaven is we are living out our belief in Jesus Christ. The first thing we do is we believe and that believing gets us into relationship with Jesus Christ. But then we start living out our belief. And we all know it's true that how we live proves what we believe. Our actions speak way louder than our words. Now, I'm not implying that we get to live out whatever we think. We get to live out what God's word says. I'm not implying that what you do gets you to heaven. What I'm saying is we live out the life of Christ and the way that he tells us to live because we believe in him. And we understand that Jesus knows better than I do. 
and that his commands are good and life-giving. And so we choose to believe what God says about money and, and worry and marriage and forgiveness and rest and our enemy and all of these things that he tells us about in his word. See, we believe all of the things that Jesus has told us in the Bible because they are right and good. And as we believe in Christ, we believe in his teachings and we know that his way is the best way. Now, John 3.16 happens to be one of the most famous verses that we have in the New Testament because it's so simply profound. I want to show you something in verse 16 I want to just break it down really quick because there's something in this verse that is important for each of us. And here's what you can notice God is communicating in verse 16. He's communicating God's part in getting us to heaven and our part in getting to heaven. Now it's interesting. We're going to see four things that God does and only one thing that we're called to do. But look at it with me as we look at four things that God does that are God's part in this process and the one thing we do. The verse starts with this, for God. So it's starting off by saying, here's what God did. For God so loved. The first thing that you and I have to know and have to understand about God is he loves you. Unconditionally is madly in love with you. You say, Pastor Mark, oh, you don't know what I've done today. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. For God so loved. God is motivated all the time by love, not by hate, not by judgment, not by anger. God is always motivated by love, and he wants to love you every single day of your earthly life and he wants to love you for eternity. For God so loved the world. Now this one's interesting because this one is a shift. By the way, that's a massive shift. If you are from the Jewish descent in the Jewish culture, you have been taught one thing from birth, that God loves the Jews and doesn't love the Gentiles. So this is a shift. What God is communicating here is, no, I love the world. I love every single person that I've created in the world. And and for us today, this could be challenging because what God is saying is, I love the people of Cheney and the people of the United States as much as I love the people in Iran. You say, but that can't be because the people in Iran want to kill us. That, how could that possibly be the case? Well, aren't you glad that the love that gets us to heaven is not based on how we love? It's based on how God loves. And God loves every single one of us. That means God loves Hitler at the same rate that he loves Mother Teresa. Now, how he can do that, I don't know. But I know he does. I know it's unlike my love and I'm sure happy it's not like my love because I'd have ditched me a long time ago. For God so loved the world he gave. Now this is another piece of who God is, the character of God that you and I need to understand. God's a giver, not a taker. He's always wanting to give to you, pour into your life, bless you, He wants to give things to you if you will open your life to him. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Now we get to the end and we realize, wait a second, he gave something very important. He gave his son. And what did his son do? His son died on a cross and rose again for you and I. Now here's something we need to know. It's very important. Heaven is not free. This is a pastor Mark. I thought anybody could get in. All you have to do is believe. Yeah, that's what we get now that it's been paid for us. It's not free. It was super expensive. You know what it cost? It cost pure, undefiled, holy blood of a perfect person. 
That's what it costs for you and I to go to heaven. And that means you're out, me too. So what it costs was his son. And it's free to us, but it wasn't free to him and it wasn't free to Jesus. See, heaven was extremely expensive. If heaven was on the market today, it wouldn't be at Walmart. It'd be at Nordstrom's, right? It'd be like those shoes that you can't buy. <laughs> It'd be right next to those. Whoa, heaven's 456 trillion billion Google dollars? I don't have that. Neither does Bill Gates. It's because it's not based on money. It's based on our part. And our part is to believe in him. For God, that's his part, so loved the world he gave his son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Our only part is believing. So well, Pastor Mark, that means I don't have to do anything. Bingo! You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be anything. You simply have to believe. Receive the free gift. Now, this takes us to a huge myth buster about heaven. Huge. Because I hear people like say this all the time. I can't believe in a God who would send people to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. Did you notice that? In fact, it's the opposite. None of the verses that we read said God sends people to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. God also doesn't send people to heaven. Look at verse 18 with me very closely. Verse 18. I'll read it slowly so it can sink in. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now here's what's interesting. What's in this verse? Choice. Free will. See, Jesus has brought us full circle back to the garden again where you and I get a choice to either choose life or death. And the free gift of life is sitting in front of us all the time. Heaven is our choice. God's not choosing to send anybody anywhere. He leaves the choice to us. And he simply said, look at my son so that you can know how much I love you and then make your choice. The choice is ours. Let me talk about this choice that you and I have with an illustration and a conclusion. Going to heaven can be kind of like taking a ride on a plane. In the mail, you receive a free plane ticket. Free is good, right? You get a free plane ticket in the mail. Now, the ticket is strange because the ticket just says, show up at the airport anytime you want and you can get on the plane. You're like, that's interesting. Normally, there's a time and I got to be there, a certain flight. Uh-uh. This ticket just says, anytime you want, show up, you can get on the plane. So you go to the airport, you get checked in, start waiting in the boarding area, and they start announcing the boarding of your flight. And they're inviting everyone to get on board. Anyone can get on board. All these people in the room that have received free tickets. But there's one condition to boarding the plane. You must believe in the pilot. The guy that's flying the plane. By the way, his name's Jesus, just so you know. You ask where the plane is going and the attendant says, that's not important. You just have to trust that the pilot knows where he's going. The invitation is still being given over the loudspeaker. There's some people that are staying and in line to get on. Some people are le leaving. And then you hear something interesting. Over the loudspeaker, they're announcing the last call for the flight. And like they often do at the airport, they start calling your specific name. Mark, Mark Postuma, would you like to get on this flight? And you're like, oh, they know my name. 
you decide to accept the invitation. You confess your belief in the pilot, Jesus, to the attendant at the door and you board the plane. When you get on the plane, you discover that it's on its way to heaven and you're like, sweet. I knew this had to be awesome because it was free. <laughs> it's on its way to heaven. But the pilot says, hey, just so you know, there's gonna be lots of stops on the way. And also, just to be fair, there's gonna be turbulence. And there's gonna be moments you're gonna wanna grab that barf bag as fast as you can because you're gonna think the plane's going down. But don't worry, I've flown this plane a lot, it ain't going down. And there's gonna be times where it's just smooth sailing and we'll just cruise along to the next stop. You also discover that there's some directions now that you're on the plane and you're getting ready to go that you need to follow and be aware of. And so the attendant is talking about those directions and she tells you that, you know, whenever the pilot comes over the loudspeaker, you're gonna wanna listen to the pilot because this, this is how things are gonna go from now on. This is your new life, listening and following the directions of the pilot. And then the last thing that happens is interesting, just like it does on any flight. The flight attendant says, so if you're cool with all of this, then feel free to stay on the plane. But uh, if this isn't cool to you, then you can get off the plane. We're gonna close the door in a couple minutes. And you notice there's a couple people that are getting up and they're getting off and they're kind of grumbling. Oh, I hate following instructions. I'm not following instructions. That pilot, what does he think? You think he knows where he's going? I know where I'm going. I'm getting off. But you decide to stay on the plane. The plane backs away from the terminal, begins to taxi out the runway. The pilot comes out of the cockpit and he tells you how overjoyed he is that you've chosen to stay on the plane. You're about to take off and you'll be on your way. He turns to leave to go back into the cockpit. And you notice he's got holes in his hands. Two things from this story, one or three, you must believe in the pilot to get on the plane to heaven. Two, the ticket was free. And three, once you got on the plane and you're starting your new life, there's some things, there's some directions. There's some life with Christ that we must follow while we're on the plane, which leads us back to our question. How do I know if I'm going to heaven? Well, do you believe in Jesus? Is he your pilot or are you the pilot? Do you fly your own plane or do you let Jesus fly your plane and you trust him with it? Do you trust Jesus no matter what, even when there's turbulence? Are you living for him? Now we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about direction. Are you heading his direction? None of us are perfect, but are you heading his direction? as often as you possibly can. See, heaven is this reality. It's a truth. It's real. For those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and live for him all the days of their life and really look forward to being with Jesus forever. That's heaven in a nutshell.